preamble, this is not a China question, but it, the question here is, to what degree any lessons learned from the investments on STEM education in the, in the 60s, of which some of the adults in this session are products of? Okay. Um, the, the reason Marco de Capua said this wasn't a question about China is he was, among other things in his career, our science counselor at the embassy in Beijing, did a great job. Um, the lessons of the 60s, uh, a big lesson uh, of the 60s, which really started with the famous Sputnik moment in 1957, is that inspiration is extremely important. And in fact, the PCAST uh, report on K through 12 STEM education uh, had the subtitle, Inspire and Prepare. Uh, we need to make equal efforts at inspiring our young people to be interested in science, technology, engineering, and math, and in preparing them uh, to succeed in continuing education and careers in, uh, in this domain. One of the features of uh, the Educate to Innovate initiative that I mentioned with three quarters of a billion dollars of private and philanthropic support is companies, universities, and national laboratories contributing the time of their scientists and mathematicians and engineers to go into classrooms with middle school and high school teachers, not just to help develop more hands-on approaches to teaching, but to inspire the kids with their real-world examples of what exciting careers can be had in, in these domains. You know, people keep asking, where are we going to get the Sputnik moment uh, for today? And some people say it's clean energy. Some people say uh, it's climate change. Some people say uh, it's the enormous potential of broadband and high-speed computing and big data together to expand our understanding uh, of, of our world. But uh, I think the most important thing in this domain is no longer one silver bullet, one form of inspiration. I think it is to get out into the population of our young people and their parents, the idea that there is an enormous diversity of exciting projects, an enormous number of frontiers opening up to which kids uh, can contribute. Uh, that inspiration part, uh, we're working on the preparation part too, but the lesson of the 60s, this enormous flowering of interest in science, te technology, engineering, uh, that came uh, much more from inspiration than from advances in method. Please. Can you identify yourself, please? Sure, and, uh... thanks. Hi, my name is Anand Merchant. Um, I'm a bioinformaticist at the National Cancer Institute. Uh, so, you know, given that I'm coming from the bioinformatics perspective, uh, the question is about the big data slide that you showed, and I was very happy to see that. Uh, we are very close to the kinds of deluge of data that, that we see coming from clinical as well as basic cancer. The question is, the major problem we face is about data sharing. Uh, you know, we talked about collaborative efforts that need to be done, but there is still this uh, bottleneck where data is, is, is sharing is not yeah. as a priority. So what are your directions on that? Well, th th there are a number of issues in data sharing. One is compatibility of, of uh, format and the technical questions of, uh, of making data usable by a much wider array of users. And then there are questions, of course, in the biomedical domain is one important one uh, related to privacy. And, and we are working uh, very hard on those issues because we do think uh, there is enormous potential in wider access uh, to health data, in understanding what works and what doesn't work in therapies, including cancer therapies, uh, in basically using the experience of vast numbers of physicians and patients to greatly expand what we can learn from the relatively small set of controlled studies alone. Uh, but that does uh, involve taking privacy issues very seriously. Uh, our new chief technology officer uh, in, the, uh, in the administration, Todd Park, who has succeeded uh, Anish Chopra in that role, comes from the health sector, very much preoccupied uh, with finding the answers uh, to those questions. Please. Sir, Ruth McWilliams, NASA headquarters. Based on what you've identified as our fiscal challenges for NASA, what do you see as our future ability to support the president's policies that you've outlined? Well, of course, I have to be optimistic about that future. And uh, Charlie Bolden and I are close friends and close collaborators in figuring out uh, how to get 20 pounds of missions done with 10 pounds of budget. Uh, we need to be ingenious. We need uh, bigger contributions from the private sector. Uh, the theory of the case 
in expanding support uh, for uh, commercial crew and commercial cargo uh, was that ultimately uh, we can turn over to the private sector the relatively routine, it's never really routine, but the relatively routine task of lifting crew and cargo to the International Space Station and eventually other low Earth orbit emissions in order to allow NASA to focus its unique capabilities on the more demanding uh, exploration missions beyond uh, low Earth orbit. Ultimately, uh, we're going to have to continue to do uh, an increasingly active job in making the case for NASA's budgets uh, because we're not going to get there uh, without the budgets. Uh, there was uh, an op-ed piece in the Washington Post uh, last week by Charles Krauthammer, which uh, I thought uh, erroneously argued that the ceremony transferring the shuttle discovery from NASA possession to the possession of the Smithsonian was a funeral for the U.S. space program. Charlie and I wrote a blog together explaining that that's far from the case. The United States re remains the world leader in virtually every aspect of uh, space exploration, robotic and human. That will continue to be the case as long as the Congress provides appropriate budgets. Uh, but we're going to need those budgets. No matter how ingenious we get in squeezing more out of an inadequate amount, uh, ultimately the amounts have to be adequate. Okay, I think we'll actually only get these last two, so I apologize to the others waiting. Go ahead. Thank you. I'm Johanna Wolfson. I am a physical chemistry doctoral student at MIT, and I lead the MIT Science Policy Initiative. Uh, this question is about collaboration. With the perspective that comes from leading OSTP in the executive office of the president, what have you seen about what makes interagency efforts work really well when they work well, and how would you like to design these collaborations so that they can be as fruitful as possible? Well, the first thing that makes interagency collaboration work well is uh, recognition of the need that comes from uh, understanding and being able to describe the symbioses uh, that are going to take place when, when agencies and departments work together rather than separately. Second thing that is enormously important in that domain is a spirit of collegiality in which you're perfectly willing and happy to share credit and which you don't uh, foment territorial disputes by uh, trying to claim exclusive uh, leadership uh, in, in these collaborative ventures. Uh, it's important that we call collaborations uh, joint ventures uh, at every opportunity so that it's clear how important uh, the mutual participation is. One of my mentors many, many years ago uh, said to me something that I think many mentors have said to their mentees, which is, you get a lot more done if you don't care so much who gets the credit. Here, here. Please. Good morning. My name is Marlett Hazlett. I'm with the Georgia Tech Research Institute, and I was wondering what your role of the, the view of the state government is in science and technology policy. Well, state government... Um, has played uh, an important role in uh, creating conditions in various states that are conducive to innovation, conducive to high-tech business. Uh, state governments uh, do not, of course, have the level of financial resources to invest in R&D that the federal government does, but they still made some, in many cases, some very important and targeted investments, particularly the bigger states, New York, California, Texas, Wisconsin, uh, Michigan, uh, state governments, of course, have an enormously important role in supporting the great research universities that exist uh, in our public university system. And uh, that is a particular challenge in these budget times. Uh, the state universities uh, are suffering uh, in many cases because of inadequacies in the state budgets. Uh, the states uh, very desperately need to get their financial houses in order so that they can continue to support uh, our great uh, public research uh, universities. Uh, there's probably more that could be said, but I know I have to be back at the White House, and this I know. Uh, has to move on. So let me just thank you again for all those great questions uh, and for your attention this morning, and let me thank Alan for being so kind to me and not asking any of the really nasty ones. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be later. So let's thank Dr. Holton. Thank you, John.